Um, hello, Steve Surfas here, continuing with uh, this series of videos about free will. And actually, um, right now, I've been commenting for, this was the fourth video commenting on John chapter 6, which has some wonderful teaching about how Jesus was teaching and drawing men to Christ, to himself, to be saved. Uh, if you, um, it would be ideal for you, obviously, to go back to the very first video, which defines free will. But at the very least, if you start jumping in at this point, you want to go back to video uh, number 10 on free will, just to see all the comments. Uh, they are all place a hole on this chapter 6 of John. So going back at this point, we're down at verse 54, continuing on, and he says, Whoever eats my flesh, we're talking about how Jesus is explaining to them, and this is scandalous to them, that uh, it's not just the believing that's going to do. They're not just going to have to make up their minds about who Jesus is and the claims he's making for themselves and decide whether he's simply the son of Joseph and Mary or whether he is truly come down from heaven, as he says. But he's saying that for them to really have life, they need to eat of his body and of his flesh. And uh, verse 54, going on this, he says, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So again, there's something that we do that he's saying you do. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood, we don't do that without an invitation. We don't do that without the Holy Spirit working in our lives. But again, there's some point where in God's working at man, it crosses over from what he's doing and begins to, do some, begins to be something that we are doing. And so whoever eats, there's, that's we do the eating. Okay, my flesh and drinks my blood. We obviously cannot provide what his flesh is and what his blood is. Let's not be ridiculous. But whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up in the last day. My whole point here is that there's a working together by design of God and taught in Scripture what God does and what he asks and calls us to do. He moves in us by the Holy Spirit but there's a working together that we see. There's a, an operation together that we see in this because God designed it that way. No other reason, because it's taught in Scripture. He says, For my flesh is real flesh, in verse 55, and my blood, uh, it, it, my, my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. He's talking about the close fellowship that we're going to have the unity with Christ that, that is going to allow us to have eternal life, that gives us eternal life. Uh, just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. Okay, Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is very interesting. Because the, he says, just as the Father sent me and I live because the Father, Jesus is going to work in us and, and, and feed, if we feed on him, we will live because of him. Who do we live because of? Because of Christ. But why do we live because of Christ? We feed on him. We come to him. Um, again, that's just the way he worked it out. Verse 58, this is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. So again, Jesus still talking to um, people here who are not, who are carnal minded, who are worried about lunch, and but he tries to shock them into to, uh, reality here a little bit and says, hey, yeah, they had all that manna, but they died. So I'm talking to you about something that bread feeds on this bread and you'll live forever. And so he said this while teaching in the, in the synagogue at Capernaum. Now verse 60, uh, here we, we see the, get really to the, to the decision point of this. In this he's been a, a, appealing and, and, and talking to their reason and, 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 and to uh, scripture and, and asking them to respond in, in a certain way in, in, in believing and accepting. But on hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Okay, now that's an important question. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Especially in the light of the verse we had looked at in the previously, where it talked about uh, listening, learning, and coming. Where are they at in this, position, in this part of listening, learning, and coming? I would suggest that they have listened 
I would suggest that they have uh, learned and now they are at the point of deciding, am I going to come or am I not going to come? Because they, they have heard, they understand what he said. And their analysis of what he said is this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Okay, They are at the point here where they have heard, they have understood, and they say now it's a matter of me accepting it. Okay, So in this accepting part, he says, Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? Okay, There's still them taking this in, analyzing it, and saying, Hey, this is an offense for me. He says, What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? And of course, we know Jesus did that, ascended into heaven. And listen, at verse 63 is a very beautiful verse. The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. And basically this whole conversation has been, are you going to worry about the physical flesh uh, here? Or are you going to worry about the Spirit? And he's saying the Spirit gives life, um, the, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are Spirit and they are life. So Jesus is saying, I'm speaking to you words and these words are Spirit. God is a Spirit. God is working on them through these words. God is working on them. It, it, the, the words he's speaking are spirit and they're life. He's imparting life to them. They haven't made a decision. They're finding it hard to accept this, but he's saying, I have spoken to you. The words I have spoken to you, they're spirit and they're life. So he's beginning to give life to these people dead in their sins through the word. He's beginning to give them uh, some of his spirit through the word. To, try, to, to invite them to make a decision for him. Uh, yet there are some of you who do not believe. Jesus is looking at here, if you notice, some of you who have not believed, he's saying, well, some of them have. So some of them have believed and some of them have not believed. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. The interesting point here is the sovereignty of God and the all-knowing of God from before the creation of the world. He knows who's not going to believe, but all of this interchange and all of this believing and not believing is given in a, th in a, in a context of, I'm giving you the word, I'm giving the spirit and its life, you're hearing the words, I've spoken them to you, so what are you going to do with them? In the context of giving them a free will choice, he still knows who did not believe, who's going to believe, who is not going to believe, who is going to betray him. So we see here an important rule according to this text in John that God giving free will and asking men to take a free will response to his words which are spirit and life does not mess up, does not trip up his sovereignty. He's sovereign enough to say, I'm going to let you decide and yet I know what's going to happen in your heart. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. Okay. Again, a key verse here and talks about the sovereignty of God. It says, no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. So again, we see part of that enabling. Jesus has said, this spirit, these words I've spoken to you are spirit and um, their life. And so we've seen part of that there. But in the end, God has to enable. No one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. Again, we're talking about this line here. Do you see the word enabled? And I'm, Again, we could go into the Greek and look at what that word means and where it's used in different places and so forth. But assuming it's fairly well translated in the NIV here, you enable someone to do something. This is like teaching the man to fish instead of giving him a fish. You enable him. No one can come. Who is coming? The Father cannot and does not come for us. We come. He enables. We come. Again, I don't, I'm not, it's not my concern to try and, and, and to say I'm a very wise man and I know exactly where this little line is at, where what God does ends and what we do begins. I'm just trying to point out that in this book, of, in this chapter 6 of John, both things are there. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Do you want to leave me to, do you want to, you do not want to leave me too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. So Peter answers and says, who can we go to? Because we have believed. 
Same information as the other people, but they had believed. God bless you.